And now chapter 20, conversation between Maitreya and Vidura. Sutta Goswami, after the earth was again situated in its orbit, what did Svayambhuva Manu do to show the path of liberation to persons who were to take birth later on? Shonaka Rishi inquired about Vidura, who was a great devotee and friend of Lord Krishna, and who gave up the company of his elder brother because the latter, along with his sons, played tricks against the desires of the Lord. Sutta Goswami said, Vidura was born from the body of Veda Vyas and was not less than he. Thus he accepted the lotus feet of Krishna wholeheartedly and was attached to his devotees. Vidura was purified of all passion by wandering in sacred places and at last he reached Haridwar where he met the great sage who knew the science of spiritual life and he inquired from him. Shonaka Rishi therefore asked, What more did Vidura inquire from Maitreya? There must have been many narrations of the spotless pastimes of the Lord. The hearing of such narrations is exactly like bathing in the water of the Ganges, for it can free one from all sinful reactions. O Sutta Goswami, all good fortune to you. Please narrate the activities of the Lord, which are all magnanimous and worth glorifying. What sort of devotee can be satiated by hearing the nectarine pastimes of the Lord? On being asked to speak by the great sages of Naimasharanya, the son of Romaharshana, Sutta Goswami, whose mind was absorbed in the transcendental pastimes of the Lord, said, Please hear what I shall now speak. Vidura, the descendant of Bharat, was delighted to hear the story of the Lord, who, having assumed by his own divine potency the form of a boar, had enacted the sport of lifting the earth from the bottom of the ocean, and indifferently killing the demon Hiranyaksha. Vidura then spoke to the sage as follows. Since you know of matters inconceivable to us, tell me, O holy sage, what did Brahma do to create living beings after evolving the Prajapatis, the progenitors of all living beings? How did the Prajapatis, such progenitors of living entities as Marichi and Svayambhuva Manu, create according to the instruction of Brahma? And how did they evolve this manifested universe? Did they evolve the creation in conjunction with their respective wives? Did they remain independent in their action? Or did they all jointly produce it? Maitreya said, When the equilibrium of the combination of the three modes of nature was agitated by the unseen activity of the living entity, by Mahavishnu and by the force of time, the total material elements were produced. As impelled by the destiny of the jiva, the false ego, which is of three kinds, evolved from the Mahatattva, in which the element of rajas predominates. From the ego, in turn, evolved many groups of five principles. Separately unable to produce the material universe, they combined with the help of the energy of the Supreme Lord and were able to produce a shining egg. For over 1,000 years, the shiny egg lay on the waters of the causal ocean in the lifeless state, and the Lord entered it as Garbodakashai Vishnu. 
from the navel of the personality of Godhead, Garbodakashai Vishnu sprouted a lotus flower, effulgent like a thousand blazing suns. This lotus flower is the reservoir of all conditioned souls, and the first living entity who came out of the flower was the omnipotent Brahma. When that Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is lying on the Garbodak Ocean, entered the heart of Brahma, Brahma brought his intelligence to bear, and with the intelligence invoked, he began to create the universe as it was before. First of all, Brahma created from his shadow the coverings of ignorance of the conditioned souls. They are five in number and are called Tamisra or envy and anger, Anda Tamisra or the idea that death ends all, Tamas or ignorance of the soul, Moha or the illusion of the bodily concept of life, and Maha Moha or being mad after material enjoyment. Out of disgust, Brahma threw off the body of ignorance, and taking this opportunity, yakshas and rakshasas sprang for possession of the body, which continued to exist in the form of night. Night is the source of hunger and thirst. Overpowered by hunger and thirst, they ran to devour Brahma from all sides and cried, Spare him not! Eat him up! Brahma, the head of the demigods, full of anxiety, asked them, Do not eat me, but protect me. You are born from me and have become my sons. Therefore you are yakshas and rakshasas. He then created the chief demigods, who were shining with the glory of goodness. He dropped before them the effulgent form of daytime, and the demigods sportingly took possession of it. Lord Brahma then gave birth to the demons from his buttocks, and they were very fond of sex. Because they were too lustful, they approached him for copulation. The worshipful Brahma first laughed at their stupidity, but finding the shameless Asuras close upon him, he grew indignant and ran in great haste out of fear. He approached the personality of Godhead, who bestows all boons and who dispels the agony of his devotees and of those who take shelter of his lotus feet. He manifests his innumerable transcendental forms for the satisfaction of his devotees. Lord Brahma, approaching the Lord, addressed him thus, My Lord, please protect me from these sinful demons who are created by me under your order. They are infuriated by an appetite for sex and have come to attack me. My Lord, you are the only one capable of ending the affliction of the distressed and inflicting agony on those who never resort to your feet. The Lord, who can distinctly see the minds of others, perceived Brahma's distress and said to him, Cast off this impure body of yours. Thus commanded by the Lord, Brahma cast off his body. The body given up by Brahma took the form of the evening twilight, when the day and night meet, a time which kindles passion. The Asuras, who are passionate by nature, dominated as they are by the element of Rajas, took it for a damsel whose lotus feet resounded with the tinkling of anklets, whose eyes were wide with intoxication, and whose hips were covered by fine cloth, over which shone a girdle. Her breasts projected upward because of their clinging to each other, and they were too contiguous to admit any intervening space. She had a shapely nose and beautiful teeth. A lovely smile played on her lips, and she cast a sportful glance at the Asuras. Adorned with dark tresses, she hid herself, as it were, out of shyness. Upon seeing that girl, the Asuras were all infatuated with an appetite for sex. 
The demons praised her. Oh, what a beauty, what rare self-control, what a budding youth. In the midst of us all, who are passionately longing for her, she is moving about like one absolutely free from passion. Indulging in various speculations about the evening twilight, which appeared to them endowed with the form of a young woman, the wicked-minded Asuras treated her with respect and fondly spoke to her as follows. Who are you, O oh pretty girl? Whose wife or daughter are you? And what can be the object of your appearing before us? Why do you tantalize us, unfortunate as we are, with the priceless commodity of your beauty. Whoever you may be, O oh beautiful girl, we are fortunate in being able to see you. While playing with the ball, you have agitated the minds of all onlookers. O oh beautiful woman, when you strike the bouncing ball against the ground with your hand again and again, your lotus feet do not stay in one place. Oppressed by the weight of your full-grown breasts, your waist becomes fatigued and your clear vision grows dull as it were. Pray, braid your comely hair. The Asuras, clouded in their understanding, took the evening twilight to be a beautiful woman, showing herself in her alluring form, and they seized her. With a laugh full of deep significance, the worshipful Brahma, then evolved by his own loveliness, which seemed to enjoy itself by itself, the hosts of Gandharvas and Apsaras. After that, Brahma gave up that shining and beloved form of moonlight. Vishbhavasu and other Gandharvas gladly took possession of it. The glorious Brahma next evolved from his sloth the ghosts and fiends, but he closed his eyes when he saw them stand naked with their hair scattered. The ghosts and hobgoblins took possession of the body thrown off in the form of yawning by Brahma, the creator of the living entities. This is also known as the sleep which causes drooling. The hobgoblins and ghosts attack men who are impure and their attack is spoken of as insanity. Recognizing himself to be full of desire and energy, the worshipful Brahma, the creator of the living entities, evolved from his own invisible form, from his navel, the hosts of Sadhyas and Pitas. The Pitas themselves took possession of the invisible body, the source of their existence. It is through the medium of this invisible body that those well versed in the rituals offer oblations to the sadhyas and pittas in the form of their departed ancestors on the occasion of Shraddha. Then Lord Brahma, by his ability to be hidden from vision, created the Siddhas and Vidyadaras and gave them that wonderful form of his known as Antardana. One day, Brahma, the creator of the living entities, beheld his own reflection in the water, and admiring himself, he evolved Kimburushas as well as Kinaras out of that reflection. The Kimburushas and Kinaras took possession of that shadowy form left by Brahma. That is why they and their spouses sing his praises by recounting his exploits at every daybreak. Once Brahma lay down with his body stretched at full length. He was very concerned that the work of creation had not proceeded apace, and in a sullen mood he gave up that body too. O oh dear Vidura, the hair that dropped from that body transformed into snakes, and even while the body crawled along with his hands and feet contracted, there sprang from it ferocious serpents and nagas with their hoods expanded.
One day Brahma, the self-born, the first living creature, felt as if the object of his life had been accomplished. At that time he evolved from his mind the Manus who promote the welfare activities of the universe. The self-possessed creator gave them his own human form. On seeing the Manus, those who had been created earlier, the demigods, the Gandharvas, and so on, applauded Brahma, the lord of the universe. They prayed, O creator of the universe, we are glad. What you have produced is well done. Since ritualistic acts have now been established soundly in this human form, we shall all share the sacrificial oblations. Having equipped himself with austere penance, adoration, mental concentration, and absorption in devotion, accompanied by dispassion, and having controlled his senses, Brahma, the self-born living creature, evolved great sages as his beloved sons. To each one of these sons, the unborn creator of the universe gave a part of his own body, which was characterized by deep meditation, mental concentration, supernatural power, austerity, adoration, and renunciation. Thus ends the twentieth chapter of the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Conversation Between Maitreya and Vidura.